Football has become America's favorite sport, but it wasn't always that way. The original game looked nothing like it does today. There were many contributors to the advancement of the game, but only one of them was dubbed the father of American football. In this episode, I'm going to give you the name of that innovative individual and tell you how his efforts contributed to the United States being victorious in the First World War. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. So now we step off our time machine. And the date is April 7th, 1859, and we're in New Britain, Connecticut, where our hero was born. Our hero's name is Walter Chauncey Camp, and like I said earlier, he was dubbed the father of American football. Now we're going to get into the reasons why he was dubbed the father of American football throughout this episode. Before we get into why he was dubbed the father of American football, we got to kind of get a baseline for what created this individual and how he got to where he was. He attended Hopkins Grammar High School in New Haven, Connecticut, and when he was there, he was a star athlete. He was good at all sorts of sports, rowing, track, swimming, baseball, and then there's the obvious ones of soccer and rugby, which would be kind of like, you know, smashed together to be create this game that we know as football. So then after high school, he went to his college of choice, which was Yale, one of the more prestigious schools in the nation, and uh, he, he started in 1876. Then he graduated in 1880 with his bachelor's. And one of the things I saw was he was given the honor of class poet, which I wonder if down the road that ended up helping him with creating some of the rule changes and possibly persuading individuals to, you know, kind of be on his side as far as the different kind of rule changes. Never hurts being able to be what I call a lyrical genius, if you know what I mean. So after he received his bachelor's in 1880, camp enrolled into medical school at Yale, which, as a young boy, his dream was to become a doctor, until he realized that he liked sports more, and then that became his new dream. In 1882, he dropped out of medical school, and he started working at the Manhattan Clock Company. And then a year later after that, he worked for the New Haven Clock Company, where he rose to an executive position, and in 1903, he became the president. So this whole time, he has this manufacturing style background and precision with clocks and that kind of thing. So it was fitting that an article from the New England Historic Society stated as such, Leave it to a clockmaker named Walter Camp to turn a chaotic excuse for a brawl into the game of precision and time limits we now know as football. Now this can't, th- this article came out way after Camp invented football, of course, but it's just kind of interesting to think that Camp had that clockwork mentality in manufacturing, and we find out later that when he was a coach, he actually structured his practices just like you would structure a a manufacturing assembly line, where each position had a specific style of practice skills, where in the past, it'd just be like, okay, everybody take the ball, let's go do this, and it was rugby too, so it was a little bit different back in the day, where it was like, ball in the middle, scrum, let's go for it, everybody just run around, try not to get dead, not get killed. So before we go any further, we're going to have to go back to the beginning times when camp started playing football at Yale, because that's going to start really setting the stage. It was at Yale where he really put his mark on the game of football, which would ultimately lead to what you and I now know as a National Football League. There were a few different sources for stating when he actually started playing varsity football at Yale. Um, One said 1877 and some others said 1876, but they all pretty much said that he played from around that time frame, either 76 or 77, until 1882. But nonetheless, apparently he was kind of a smaller individual at 156 pounds. Granted, 156 pounds back, you know, in 1876 or 1877 is not quite the same as what it is today. There's many articles and photos that you see of uh, football players 
back in the day compared to football players nowadays. Um, for instance, an offensive line. I mean, basically, our offensive linemen now are like what twice the size as they were back then. Um, you know, the offensive line back then would be the size of our running backs nowadays. Uh, on average, of course, there were going to be some few exceptions that were going to stand out above the crowd, which we will get a little bit of that into the next episode. So bringing it back, uh, there was a quote from a player named Nathaniel Curtis to the then Yale captain Gene Baker that goes as such. Uh, you don't mean to let that child play, do you? He will get hurt. Pretty straight to the point, but what he was getting at is, hey, you got this little dude? Dude gonna get smashed. And I don't want that on my hands, man. But it makes me wonder, how much did the diminutive size of camp lead to some of these possible rule changes down the road? Um, Was it maybe because he was trying to help everybody be a part of the game as opposed to just the big brute strength type guys where it was run, smash, crash? And that was about it, you know, instead of like advancing the ball in a rhythmic type pattern, um, him being a clockmaker down the road probably can have something to do with that with timing. But yeah, I don't know. Let's just say that we're about to figure out some of the reasons why they named him the father of American football. And it started pretty early in his career because even though he had only been on the team for a year or two, he was named the captain of the Yale team, which at the time was pretty much the equivalent to a head coach because they didn't have, you know, true head coaches. Um, so he was the captain of the team in 78, 79, and 81. But he did serve as the actual head coach. In fact, he was the first head coach, designated head coach at Yale between the years of 1888 and 1892, which as a teaser, in the next episode, we're going to find out that he coached and worked hand-in-hand with the first professional football player. That is the first documented professional football player. But I'm going to make you wait until that next episode before you find out who the first documented professional football player was. Camp ended up becoming a part of the Intercollegiate Football Association in 1880, which I believe this would be one of those stakes in the ground moment where you say, yep, that is a turning point because it was through this association that he was able to start having more of a voice and opinion on what are they going to do for changing the game of kind of like rugby-ish, maybe soccer-ish, maybe just rugby, maybe football, I don't know what it is, but changing it into what we would all know and recognize as the game of football. And when he was a coach, It was said that because of his executive position at the New Haven Clock Company that when he was a coach, he couldn't actually attend the practices. He uh, allegedly had his wife, whom was Alice Graham Sumner, take detailed notes to help him make the decisions. And as a coach, uh, like I said, he was detailed. Uh, Each position had a specific style of practice tailored to what they were going to perform in the game. And this was kind of an innovative style of coaching as opposed to just let everybody just kind of run around and do their thing and try to smash each other as hard as they can. And then some other contributions that Camp made to the College of Yale was, um, as an example, in 1888, he served as the Yale General Athletic Director, uh, the head advisory football coach, and chairman of Yale Football Committee. And then he did so all the way up until the First World War. He also received a small salary to serve as treasurer of Yale's financial union, which ultimately ended up accumulating $100,000 to aid in the construction of the Yale Bowl, which ended up completing construction in 1914 and was the first ever bowled football stadium, which paved the way for all the different stadiums that we see out there now. Now, I don't know how much camp actually had a say in how the stadium was built, but Just for general purposes of the story, I'd like to believe that he helped innovate the style of viewership for the fans in the stadium, and he helped them create that kind of a 360-ish style of viewing, so no matter where you're at in the stadium, you'd be able to see the game from a similar perspective. Um, Cannot prove that. Have not found that anywhere. But let's just go ahead and pretend like he helped 
pave the way for that type of stadium. Which helps us transition into the next segment where we discuss how camp was a pioneer in helping that transition into an uber exciting football experience. No longer would it be the game that we used to see is called rugby. You see, although his playing and coaching days were relevant, it's really the it's really the administration work that he did for the game of football that has helped named that ended up dubbing him the name the father of American football. And one of the historic places, which was a meeting place for the Intercollegiate Football Association, where a lot of these initial rule changes happened, was the Massasoit House in Springfield, Massachusetts. And when I kind of dug a little bit deeper down that rabbit hole, I ended up seeing that it was pretty cool. There was a lot of hip-hop happenings going on in that hotel, and I recommend you go check it out, because there was some pretty cool stuff. But you didn't come here to listen to me talk about some magnificent house or hotel or anything. You came here for me to talk to you about the creation of American football. Now, rugby was the main rough and tough sport on college campuses at that time. But Harvard and Yale had agreed to play football instead. And Harvard was the first to reject the rugby rules of a scrum or a scrummage, which is where you place a ball in the middle of the field and then all these guys get around together like kind of put their arms around and they just mash up against each other and they try to kick the ball out, which ultimately then you end up trying to run it around to the goal. Harvard did it in a way where they would kick the ball backwards to a teammate, which they would call healing it out, which I'm assuming was because, you know, you use your heel to kick it backwards, which was kind of getting closer to representing what we now see as a snap in the NFL. But we weren't quite there. And now comes camp. One of his first rules that he wanted to change, and he continued to fight for quite a while, was for 11 players to be the norm. It was first brought up on October 9th of 1878 at the meeting of the Massasoit House, and then finally it was approved on October 12th, 1880. Yale was pushing for a while to have this as a change, but so it wasn't really Camp's invention, but he was the one who just continued to push it and be the driving force behind that locomotive engine that would say, we are changing the rule to 11 players on the field because we see into the future, and that's what the football is going to be. And hence, this begins a long line of rule changes, which Walter Camp would lead for the rest of his life. He would become the most innovative originator of American football and then become dubbed the father of American football. So as I told you, on October 12th of 1880, they finally agreed that they're going to only have 11 players on the field. So to go along with the rule change to 11 players, in 1880 they also abolished the scrimmage in favor of the scrimmage line. But even though this got us a little bit closer to the game that we know today, there were still a lot of changes that had to be made before it would be revolutionized into America's favorite sport. And this became very evident in 1881, which ended up turning into a snooze fest of a game between Princeton and Yale. Both teams were undefeated at the time, and of course, neither one of them wanted to lose. And due to the new rule change, they had this line of scrimmage. So what they ended up doing is they just basically sat on the ball. And it was kind of like a keep it away from the other guy kind of thing. Instead of a let's advance this and try to win the game kind of thing. So basically ended in like a 0-0 tie. And it ultimately came down to be called what they dubbed as the block game. Which I'm understanding as blocking the other team from advancing and scoring. Because that's all we care about is don't lose. And if I was a fan at the stadium I would have been like dude this is not cool man I came here I paid to watch this and all you're gonna do is sit on the ball I mean I could be at home watching my kid do this you know even if it's a baby sitting on a little diaper I mean like come on what are you guys doing here if I'm paying for this I need you to have some kind of action this is just like I said a total snooze fest it's boring something had to be done so the next rule that camp wrote would ultimately be, would I say, the game changer as far as an excitement factor, because it would force teams to try to advance the ball 
and would force the other team to try to stop them from advancing the ball. And this rule was the initial rule for a set of down. It wasn't quite the same as it is today, but it was a good step in the right direction. And here's how Camp wrote that rule. If on three consecutive fairs and downs, a team shall not have advanced the ball five yards, nor lost ten, then they must give up the ball to opponents at the spot of the fourth down. This rule would go on to be accepted on October 12th, 1882, and forever would start to look a lot more like modern football. Now, I don't know which rule I would point to as being the most important rule change as far as making it look like modern football, but the set of downs has got to be up there. Uh, Maybe the line of scrimmage as in getting rid of the scrum, but even then it was still kind of an energetic, exciting type of game. But then when they changed it to the line of scrimmage, it, from what it looks like, created a boring game. But the set of downs, however, that gave clear direction to the teams what you have to do to win the game. But winning the game and what it was like playing on the field were a little bit different, which comes into our next rule, the scoring change. You see, there was a game between Princeton and Yale where, from what I read, Camp had scored an 80-yard touchdown, and then in another magnificent play, he took the ball from the scrum and dashed it for a second touchdown. Now both kicks were missed, which means that the touchdowns didn't count. They got zero points. I got to imagine that this fueled the fire for Camp to try and change the scoring rules. Now think about that today. Tyreek the Freak Hill takes an 80-yard screen pass to the house, and then the kicker misses the extra point. And you say, nope, that's zero points. Nothing counted. All that excitement was cool, but you get zero points. I don't think the fantasy football fans would be too happy in the world of 1882. But, as we've gone through everything else in this episode, there's going to be a rule change. And yes, your hero, Mr. Camp, was at the center of it. At the convention on October 17th, 1883, he secured a new scoring system of numerical values. It wasn't quite like we know today, but at least it was a step in the right direction. You see, the original scoring system had given the team one point for a safety, two points for a touchdown, four for a goal after the touchdown, and then five for a goal from anywhere on the field, which is kind of like a field goal nowadays. So two months later, they changed it to a little bit different scoring system. They tweaked it to the point where it would make a little bit more sense for the actions on the field compared to the points that you receive for performing those actions. Now it would be turned into four points for a touchdown, two for a safety, a goal following the touchdown, basically a field, uh, you know, like an extra point would be two points, and then a goal from anywhere on the field, which is like a field goal nowadays, would remain five points. You see, they had an affinity with field goals because it comes from the roots of rugby and soccer and that kind of thing. So using the foot back then mattered a lot more than it does nowadays. Sure, we have the field goal game-winning kicks, and those are heart-pumping. But as that song by Adam Sandler goes, kickers don't matter that much in the NFL, because they are a lonesome kicker. And then after we got past this whole kicker business and nonsense, There's another rule change in 1890, which made it legal to snap the ball by hand, although snapping the ball by the foot was legal until 1913. I don't really understand why you would want to do it that way, but I guess if you're used to healing it out, or even kicking it forward in a normal rugby match, then that would be the norm, as opposed to using your hands. So nowadays, I'm glad that we snap it by hand, because... Seems like there's not as much control if you're kicking it with a foot. And another type of rule change that really changed the way that the game was played was the forward pass. Um, Camp apparently was against this, and he wasn't down with having the forward pass. I'm thinking maybe because it had something to do with his heavy rugby days as a halfback, but he eventually gave in. I wonder what Walter Camp 
would have thought about this previous Super Bowl between the Eagles and the Patriots. You see, they broke the record for having the most total passing yards in the Super Bowl of all time. And this dude thought, well, we shouldn't have this forward pass. It just goes to show how much the game has changed. Where back in the day, it was a run, smash, crash, boom. So now it's just a let's snap the ball, let these guys run around. Let's toss the ball down the field and let them score a touchdown. And it really has changed even in the short time frame of my life watching football. Where you get the running back. I mean, even there were running backs going first overall. Where he's going to get the ball 30 times a game. We're going to smash it down the throat. And we're going to run to set up the pass. Where nowadays, there's a lot of teams like, just bring up the Super Bowl for instance. You have teams where they're passing to set up the run. And it's starting to shift back a little bit again where the running backs are starting to come back into dominance. And that's just the nature of the NFL. You have these constant, ever-evolving changes, which is what started back with Walter Camp. He looked at the landscape of the game, and he saw how it was being played. He saw the reactions of the fans. He saw how the players would react to the different kind of rule changes. And then he, in his crazy little mind, which must have been just spinning nonstop all the time, would say, hmm, what if we did it this way? Or I wonder what would happen if we made this rule change. And then, boom, put that magic dust out in the air, and we have this great game of American football. And we have the National Football League. And the rule changes that we just discussed were some of the most impactful, if not the most impactful ones, to create the NFL as it is today. But they're not the only ones that Camp was involved in. He helped pave the way for transitioning from rugby into football for the better part of three decades. Pretty much spent his entire adult life working to improve and change the game of football to what it is today. And a lot of it had to do with trying to make it more exciting. But then again, there was a lot of it that had to do with player safety which was at the top of mind back then, as it is top of mind today. Now, football back in the late 19th century, before camp, looked nothing like it does today, as we have already discussed. I'm not just talking about the rules of the game as far as the mechanics and what you can and cannot do as far as 11 players, line of scrimmage, and those sorts of things. I'm talking about the pure, barbaric, gladiator style raw carnage all over the field this game had similarities to what they called medieval european mob football where it was pretty much no holds barred one place that i saw was the only rule they had was no manslaughter or murder Eh, maybe if it happens it happens but you should not intentionally do it that's me shaking my finger at you right now And Harvard had a tradition where the freshman and sophomore class played a game of rugby against each other, which started in 1827. And it was labeled Bloody Monday because it was known to be just an all-out brawl, a brutal blood-flying, spit, sweaty, I'm going to smash your face in. And it was just an all-out brawl. It was so intense and brutal that towns pressured the college administrators to shut it down. So ultimately, they ended up banning it. It will come back later, of course, but in a little bit different form. To kind of give you an example of the raw brutality that was shown, as I seen an article where they basically described players putting nails in their shoes and even some on their clothing and just all sorts of foreign objects for when smashing into the other guy. You would create this painful connection of you to them. And I'm guessing that the purpose is to cause such a great pain to the other player that they would either take themselves out of the game or give you some kind of advantage to just grab this ball and just go wherever you want. I mean, because there were no rules, basically. I mean, it said no manslaughter or murder. Um, There was unlimited players. I mean, you could be getting hit from all over the field. It just thinking about it, it's like that game you play in school where Kind of like it, um, you know, you give the ball to one dude and it's like, hey, you're it. Everybody try to tackle him. But 
a little bit more brutal, especially if you were the smaller guy who happened to get smashed on top of the pile and you have these nails sticking out of people's clothing and shoes and such. And, um, well, I just don't really want to think about it because that would probably not be too fun. Now, again, I don't know the legitimacy of these claims. It was just in a couple articles, but, but just the thought of them describing such a horrific scene puts chills in your body and makes you think, yeah, we probably need to put a little bit of safety features into this game. Otherwise, it's not going to last that long. Which is what Camp did. In 1891, he spearheaded a deep dive into the dangers of the game. And it took him a few years, but in 1894, he ended up publishing in the football figures and facts that indeed, football is dangerous. But he did want to convey the message that football does provide physical and mental benefits, which we all agree nowadays that, you know, there's physical benefits, obviously, because of the physicality and getting yourself in shape. But then there's also the mental benefits, you know, the confidence, the camaraderie, the purpose for a goal, all sorts of things. But this doesn't negate the fact that this game was just insanely dangerous for players. And it was under much scrutiny across the nation. In fact, in 1905, 18 young men had died. And Teddy Roosevelt summoned representatives from Yale, Harvard, and Princeton to the White House. So they could all try to figure out, how are we going to keep this game alive? Try not to get it abolished. At the same time, keep the players safe. And our boy, Mr. Walter Camp, was instrumental in providing suggestions and rule changes to help with player safety although he wasn't the only one. Now that's a little teaser bomb for you, if you will, for the next episode where I'm going to describe to you who the first documented professional football player was, who also knew Teddy Roosevelt. And if you want to make sure you get the freshest, newest, hottest off the press episodes of the Football History Dude, make sure you go ahead and subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast player or head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com slash subscribe for more details on how to subscribe to your favorite podcast player. Another rule prior to camp in the early 1880s that just baffles my mind nowadays when we talk about player safety and concussions and everything was it was allowed for players to hit, mind you, these are unhelmeted, generally do not wear helmets, maybe like a leather helmet or something. But it was allowed for players to hit players with closed fists in the face up to three times. For whatever reason, I guess that fourth time, no, that's illegal. But, you know, go ahead and smash him in the face three times. That'll do. So, of course, that ended up being abolished. Now, not everybody's perfect. There was a rule that Camp had suggested that allowed players to tackle other players below the waist. To kind of like, uh, I guess, level the playing field. And in his words, it was to prevent speedy backs from just doing nothing but hitting the edge and just turning on the jets and going. Of course, I don't think he said it quite like that, but I'm just saying, you know, just think about it. The guys that hit the edge, run around, keep going to the house. And yes, in theory, this was a good suggestion because, you know, you're able to, to tackle like that and be a little bit more safe, not going just for the head. But it ended up backfiring because in 1892, a countermeasure to this new rule was a move that was called the flying wedge was created. In fact, this was created at Yale. So the flying wedge is basically a bunch of linemen or blockers getting out in front of the halfback and as a group, they would smash into one defensive player. And of course, this defensive player is basically wearing no pads. I mean, not a helmet, maybe some makeshift shoulders or something like that, maybe some stuffed in their pants just to keep some protection going. But essentially, let's just call it no protection. And this is one of the moves that ended up creating a lot of those deaths that we talked about. So, as chairman of the rules committee, Camp outlawed this move, which got me to thinking because I remembered not too long ago where the NFL finally outlawed what they called the wedge on the kickoff because it was back in 2009 when the competition committee made it illegal for a wedge to be formed on kickoffs. 
And with this being said, one of the interesting things I found was reading comments from players and coaches on both sides of the decision. You see, some players were for it as well as coaches, and some were against it, claiming that they would have to just change the game altogether because this just is going to ruin our strategy. And I wonder what the players back in 1892 thought. On one hand, you have people dying. On the other hand, you have people saying, well, that's the way we've always done it. We got to, this is a game of smash them, rash them, crash them into the other guy. I mean, if you don't like it, get out of here. But ultimately, sanity proved to be the victor. And now we have a safer environment for our football players. Speaking of the mentality of players back in 1892, um, and then just all around camps, entire career was the sport was changing and evolving, but there still had to be buy-in from the general mass. So upon being an innovator for excitement in football and being the kind of champion for safety, if you will, camp also was what I would consider a marketing guru as far as trying to get the message to people all over the country to like this new game. And he used various types of marketing campaigns and tactics to advance the popularity of the game and silence the critics. Probably the biggest contribution and what most people remember him as and fall back to was he partnered with Casper Whitney to create the first All-American team, which selected the best players in the nation. Again, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the next episode. Now, Casper Whitney was a Harper's Weekly sports writer, and he was actually the first that referred to Camp as the father of American football in 1892. And Casper and Camp selected the All-American team up until 1897. But then from 1898 until his death in 1924, the teams were announced in the magazine Colliers under Camp's name only. After Camp passed away in 1924, a sports writer by the name of Grantland Rice succeeded him. Another contribution that Walter Camp had to the expansion of American football was he wrote the section for American football in the 10th and 11th editions of the Britannica Encyclopedia. He also developed a mass audience by editing the annual Spalding's Official Intercollegiate Football Guide. And overall, Camp wrote over 250 magazine and newspaper articles, nearly 30 books, and even some of the first ever celebrity exercise guides. And Mr. Walter Chauncey Camp passed away on March 14, 1925. I read a couple sources where it claimed he passed away from a heart attack at the Rules Committee. And then some other sources that said he passed away peacefully in his sleep. I'm not sure which one is correct, but either way, he gave all of his all to the game of football throughout his life. Because of this, he was honored and continues to be honored as the father of American football for all the contributions that he made to advance this game. One of the honors he received, although it was after he passed away, was he was inducted to the first collegiate football hall of fame class in 1951 and he continues to be honored by the walter camp foundation which gives an award in his name to the college player of the year each year the voting for this is done by a group of ncaa division one coaches under the jurisdiction of the walter camp foundation guidelines and the first to win this trophy was oj simpson in 1967 then he won it again in 1968. At the beginning of this episode, I told you the father of American football was at least partially responsible for the outcome of World War I. Walter Camp was the athletic advisor for the United States military. He created a workout regimen for the soldiers called the Daily Dozen, which was an 8-minute workout consisting of 12 exercises, and it was the first morning exercise show on the radio. I would like to think that this workout routine helped keep our troops in shape at least a little bit. And that little bit of an edge could have possibly helped the United States of America win the Great War. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the father of American football. In the next episode, I'm going to tell you about the first professional documented football player and how a book at the Battle of Gettysburg 
can be linked to Kirk Cousins and the NFL. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads.